Good morning. Welcome. I'm Gillian Davies, the incumbent priest of Salt Spring Anglican Parish, and I welcome all of you into this beautiful world that we're in and into this worship together. This morning, we worship together as an Easter people, some in the church, some in our homes, perhaps some in our gardens or on our balconies. Wherever we are, we are united in the spirit, gathered together in worship, finding our way forward in this new world with so many unexpected and unknowns, yet here we are united. And for that, we give thanks to God. We acknowledge the whole Kaminam and the St. Joseph speaking peoples, the traditional custodians of this land with deep respect. May the elders past and present be blessed and honored. May we join together and build a future based on compassion, justice, peace, God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
wounded God, disabled and divine, give us faith to perceive you, pierced and embodied, standing here among us, feeding us forgiveness, beautifully broken, through Christ the suffering servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. While the disciples were telling how they had seen Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of Christ. With the words of my lips, and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our God, our strength and our redeemer. In her book, Cloister Walk, Kathleen Norris tells a story shared with her by the monks she was sojourning with. First of all, you need to know that Benedictine monks take hospitality very seriously. All guests, are to be treated as the Christ. If someone turns up, you welcome them, feed them, worship with them, and get to know them. No one is to be turned away. So in our story, there's a guest at the monastery who has been very high maintenance. His mattress was pronounced lumpy. The food didn't have enough salt. People doing the readings were too fast or too slow, or they didn't speak loud enough. It was just one complaint after another. But after a while, finally, he left and went on his way. None too soon, right? And all the monks heaved a sigh of relief. But then, one day, one of the monks looked out the window, and who did he see coming up the steps but the same man back again? And he groaned, Oh, Jesus, here you come again. And all the monks chortled in deep appreciation of this story. And we might have a similar reaction to this morning's reading. Were you thinking, wait, didn't we just have this same story last Sunday? Why are we having it again? Well, that's a good question. What do you think? Is it because it was so amazing and wonderful? We just want to keep telling it to each other sharing all the different versions of how Jesus came back to be with his disciples, came back to be with us. You know how it is. When something really amazing and wonderful and life transforming happens, you can't stop talking about it. Or maybe we're having this story again because it's so complicated and beyond our 21st century reality. Jesus rising from the dead, walking through walls, eating a meal of fish with his dear friends. If that happened now, if it turned out a dear friend of ours who died was actually the child of God and then he or she died and then came back, 
what would we think? And would we even dare to tell others? Would they think we lost it, gone crazy? Because we're programmed to only believe what can be scientifically tested. And this is uncomfortably and most definitely not verifiable by scientific means, as far as we know. Or possibly the story is repeated to get our attention because there's just too many dang things competing for our attention all the time. And who knows, maybe with all these things that fill up our lives, your attention wandered last week and you never really heard the reading because there was this other conundrum in your life that you needed to chew over. Over this past week, I was mulling and pondering on the readings for today. On the one hand, Christ's resurrection is the most amazing, wonderful, fabulous, incredible reality we will ever encounter. But there's a hook in there. Because on the other hand, for us, it may indeed be incredible. Actually, we might be secretly thinking, that's really not believable or we don't know how to cope with it. And then we begin to wonder, and I began to wonder, how many of us are still trying to operate on the faith we were taught as children? How many of us, for example, have never questioned exactly what the creed means? Maybe some of us handled it like this. When I first came back to the church, it was like this. I went church shopping with my best friend, Tina. Let's go to the cathedral, I said, because they have even song and a beautiful choir. And we got there and the choir was beautiful and it was all chanted, but even more wonderful because I'd been away for a long time. There was a woman priest. And best of all, the words of the liturgy were so familiar and beautiful from my youth and my childhood. I felt like I'd come home and I wept. Afterwards, I phoned an old friend, the priest who'd been in charge of the regional Anglican youth group when I was a teenager. Some of you might have known him, Donald Grayson. And I told him what had happened. And he wept too with me and read me a poem. But then I said, I don't know if I'll stay because I'm really uncomfortable with the creed. And he said, Oh, we all cross our fingers when we say the creed. Don't let that come between you and God and coming back to church. But it was my discomfort with the creed that led me to discover something interesting. Over the months after I returned to the church of my childhood, this one, right? I was hanging around people who were question askers and God botherers. And I began to realize how much I was still functioning in some areas with the faith of my childhood. I mean, my understanding and comprehension of what all this meant was still at a 12 year old, 14 year old, 16 year old level, some of it even younger, like from my confirmation classes. A few times it was actually embarrassing because who ever talks about what things mean? Whoever asks the big questions, did Jesus really walk through the walls? Did the power of God moving through Peter and Paul really heal a man who'd been crippled all his life? How do I make sense of that in my own life? Does it mean that if my faith were deep enough and strong enough that I could heal people from cancer maybe? And what about that creed? What I realized is that using my childhood understanding of God and Jesus, of the Trinity, and even of faith healing, it wasn't big enough for who I was and who I am as an adult. It wasn't sophisticated enough. It wasn't real enough to feed my spiritual hunger and curiosity. So what do you think? What does being a Christian mean to you? Baptize Sunday school and confirmation and then just go along and we've got it all covered? What? No, you're kidding me. Think about it. 
do you still see the rest of the world now the same way you did when you were 13? Do you respond to it the same? Live in it the same? Have the same expectations? No, really. So what would ever make us think we could let our faith and our beliefs not grow up too? But do we? Do we grow our Christianity up? Become a grown up Christian? And maybe this doesn't apply to you. Maybe you've been working away at making sense of your faith all your adult life. But in case not, here's some suggestions on where to start. Because you might be wondering, how would you do that anyway? How would I grow my faith up? I think it means doing at least one of these six things. First, be curious. Ask questions of yourself, of me, if you like, of God. Pursue oddities, mysteries, things that don't match up or have always bothered you. Find answers that make sense to who you are now, or at least find the beginning of the answers. Two, confront your fears, misgivings, discomforts. Don't ignore them. It's your own wisdom telling you something isn't sitting right for you. Three, figure out. What does my faith mean to me? Who is God to me? Four, when you have some answers, look for what that means about your actions, about how you live your life. If this is true, then that is what I need to be doing. What is that that? What is it I need to be doing? Five, acknowledge your hunger. Find the spiritual food that fills you. Savor it. You're not hungry? Why not? What's that about? And finally, six. Embrace change, uncertainty, mystery, because that's where God lives. And that is where the juice is. That's where you'll find God at work in the world and in you. It's a lot, right? You could think of it as waking up, stepping out of the teenage dream world identity, deciding to be a grown-up Christian, thinking about signing up for this one. The theologian Dorothy Soleil says, change happens at the level of action that contains risk. Change happens at the level of action that contains risk. And isn't that when we know it's really worth doing? Amen. Savior Christ, you 
to be your light in all the years. Great Spirit in this ancient land, speak in the stillness deep within. Remove all prejudice and fear, give life to all new hope begin. Then help us gently walk as friends, while on this land your peace descends. While on this land your peace descends. Dear friends, bathed in the glory of the risen Lord, let us pray for the whole of creation to be made new. O Lord Jesus, risen gloriously from the dead, you have snatched us from the snares of the evil one. Hallelujah. In you, righteousness and peace kiss one another. Hallelujah. In you, all God's promises have their yes. Hallelujah. In you, we shall not die but live and declare the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Fill your church with the splendor of your life, light, and love. May its words and deeds proclaim, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hear us, Lord of glory. Crown this congregation with unfading joy, unfailing kindness, undaunted hope, and unceasing praise. Let everyone we meet see your goodness revealed in our words and deeds. In our own parish, we pray this week for the households of Reverend Elena Hyde, Joyce James, David Jardine, Sandy Johnson, and Lise Kerr. Hear us, Lord of glory. For the worldwide human family, that a new era of peace will dawn across the face of the earth. Hear us, Lord of glory. For Christian communities around the world, that they will be a leaven of love and hope in every nation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the people of the Church of Ireland and John McDowell, their Archbishop. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for our primate, Linda Nichols, for our National Indigenous Archbishop, Mark McDonald, and for the clergy and people of the Diocese of Algoma and Anne Germond, their Archbishop. In our ecclesiastical province, we pray for the territory of the People Anglican Church and Lincoln McCone, their bishop. In our diocese, we pray for Anna, our bishop, and for the people of St. Philip by the Sea in Lanceville, and David Chilman, their priest. And on our island, we pray for the people of Salt Spring Island Baptist Church and Chris Saffel, their pastor. Hear us, Lord of glory. For all whose life continues to be a way of the cross, that by God's grace, they will come to share in the joy of resurrection. This week, we pray especially for Kathy Darling, Tony and Pam Brentno, Tim Hayes, Nancy Holcroft, our Aboriginal Archbishop, Mark McDonald, and his wife, Virginia Shaw Lynn, and for the Indigenous peoples of the Anglican Church of Canada, Terry Manick, Michael Overholt, Michael Pigeon and Richard Stetson, Al and Rita Robinson, Mike and Judy Tyson, Mallory Stewart, and Colin, son of Joyce James. Prayers of transition 
for Margaret Spencer in her new home, and for David and Rico Sasaki as they prepare to return to Japan. Please take a moment now to reflect on and pray for those in your life whom you hold dear. Hear us, Lord of glory. For communities overwhelmed by hatred, fear, racism, or distrust of neighbors, that they will receive the immediate and ongoing assistance they need and find new ways to live as your people, a people of love and peace. Hear us, Lord of glory. For all involved in vaccination programs here and in all other countries, that their tireless efforts will save many lives and bring the pandemic under control. Hear us, Lord of glory. For young women and men, that they will be blessed with wise role models for respectful relationships. Hear us, Lord of glory. For all who are facing economic hardship by being moved from job keeper to job seeker, that their plight will be effectively addressed by policymakers. Hear us, Lord of glory. For the recently deceased and for those whose anniversary of death occurs around this time, that they will be raised to eternal life and glory with Christ. Hear us, Lord of glory. God, power and mercy, by raising your son, you confirmed your promise of life to the world. Send us out as your heralds of hope. We ask this through Christ, our Lord, as we pray in the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not, not into, into temptation, temptation, but, but deliver us from, from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom the power and glory, and glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May Christ who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life and the blessing of God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Christ is risen. Hallelujah.